we are recording another podcast, well, this time with Associate Teaching Professor Brent Tai at the University of Bolton. Hi, how are you today? Hi, uh, I'm good, thanks. Good. How are you in these strange COVID times? Um, strange, I think, like everybody else. Yeah. A mixture of running backwards and forwards and just finished homeschooling. So, yeah, it's all dead strange, really. Yeah, that's difficult. It is really difficult. I'll probably talk a bit more about COVID at the end, if that's okay. Yeah, but sure. I think um, it's affected us all, hasn't it? It's affected everything we do and changed everything. Yeah, and I think it's going to carry on as well for a few years. So Yeah, definitely. Some good bits. I think some good bits have come out of it. Lots of good bits, I think. I think lots of good bits. I think it's changed the way that we think and do things. So, yeah, I think there's positives here. Reflection and growth is very important. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what I want to talk to you about today, really, is your educational journey. So just to see how you were throughout. Um, thinking, if we go back to when you was in school, what type of student were you? In school? Yeah. Uh, well, it was only a couple of years ago, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, only only a couple. <laughs> wow, it's, it's, school for me was an escape, which is okay. weird to say. Um yeah. it's quite hard actually because um i'm gonna have to start by i think being a little bit of candid that i am dyslexic okay um so school and i mean considering my age as i am at 48 school really started for me back in the late 70s and for somebody who really couldn't write um i was immediately put into a box and unfortunately as i started to move through and it was a three-tier school system, so it was primary, middle school, and then grammar. Okay. Um, I, I, it, when moving to gr- a middle school, so that, that when you would traditionally go to a high school at that, that kind of age, 11, I might, I, I'd already been in middle school and labelled and put in a box because of my dyslexia. Not because of my intelligence, but because of my dyslexia. Um, that, that was coupled really hard at home because of where I grew up. Um, so I grew up in a very small rural area in East York, in East Yorkshire, um, which is which is um, where I where I lived. And the school where I went to was right next door to the most boring place in Britain. I mean, literally, that grid reference has at sea level with one telegraph line going through it. Seriously. So I mean, there were more dogs than people where I grew up. Um, and as a result of that, I was expected to take over the farm, okay. and that was it. My life was mapped out for me. I was due to be a farmer and that reflected in terms of the support I had for education. Um, Certainly from, you know, kind of like my mum's side of the family uh, where it was expected that, you know, once, once I became of age, I would get a job on the farm and I would, I would be a farmer. And then when the family passed on, I was the eldest son, the farm would eventually pass to me. And it, it was kind of like my destiny was mapped out and I was terrified of that. Um, yeah, not because I was scared of the hard work, but just uh, that's, that's not what I wanted. I, I was very much, I was very much um, into my books and reading and doing that kind of stuff. So as a result of that, I never had any support at all from home in terms of education. Wow. And it wasn't until uh, I sat then what might have been the equivalent of the 11 plus to get me into grammar school that some teachers actually sat up and realized that, oh my God, this guy's got a brain in his head. And they actually spoke to my dad, who was much more relaxed about and and understood the benefits of education much more than perhaps my mum and the farming side of the family did. Um, He was Irish, he came from Belfast. So, you know, there, there was much more of a relaxed attitude towards things. And it was like, I don't know, it's like we, my mum was kind of had a Victorian attitude to stuff. And that, you know, my life was mapped. And what do you want an education for? It's just paper, it's just books. You know, it was that kind of stuff. And um, it was two Davids, David Hill and David Geddall. And I don't know if they're alive now or not. Um, but they were the two teachers that actually went, yeah, this lad's got a brain in his head. Maybe we could do something to help him. And, well, and, and they did. And they, they got me into grammar school. Up until this point, what support had you had at school? I know you said you didn't have any support at home, but and you've mentioned that you were dyslexic. Did you know you were dyslexic? No, I just thought I was stupid. Um, why did you think that? Because I couldn't write my name when I was 13 years old properly. Um, I couldn't hold a pen properly. 
um, I could answer the questions in my head. And when I tried to put my hand up to answer them, I just got ignored because obviously I couldn't write it down. So therefore I couldn't evidence what it was. I knew I knew the answers, but I still felt like I was thick. And I was put at the back of the class and I was put in the lower sets, you know, and I was put in these places. And it, it was really difficult. Um, and as a result of that, that kind of impacted my behavior, I think. And certainly until I got into the final years of middle school, the final year of middle school. And that's what I said, that's when I met the two Davids who kind of realized that, you know, this guy's actually got a brain in his head and just because he can't write it down, we're going to have to find alternative means. What did they do? They gave me a BBC microcomputer. Wow. And they told me, and they told me how to use a very basic word processor that was on that and to type my answers in. And that all of a sudden that, I think it, it, well, it opened a door for me in like, aha, I can communicate in writing at last. I can communicate to them. Uh, and then it also pinged me down a road of technology as well, which as we'll come on to, yeah. has led me to where I am today a little bit. Yeah. So, but yeah, so that, so that was, that was interesting. I, I then experienced another set of challenges when I got into grammar school um, because it's something that my parents never managed to achieve back in the old 11 plus segregation of education type days. Um, and, and I managed to achieve that. So I ended up going to Google Grammar School. And it was at that cusp where they were changing from O levels to GCSEs. So this, again, will age me quite nicely. Um, and like most kids, like shove a load of sweets and crisps in the backpack and jump off on the bikes and, you know, scurry off out to go find the mates. Whereas um, my dad used to make me a pack up and put it in my rucksack for me along with my school books, because he knew full well that I wasn't running off to see my mates. I was running off hiding in a den that I'd made in the, in the fields in the woods next to the river. And um, I was doing my homework in there because I didn't have the space or the capacity, shall I say, and, and peace in the house to actually do it. Because if I did try to sit down and get my books out, it was like, oh, shouldn't you be out there doing something else? And it made me feel really uncomfortable to do that in the house. So my dad helped me in the best ways he could, which was helping me and supporting me with space to do that. And I, I did end up, I did end up getting my O level physics one year early, um, and then I sat it again at the GCSE to to do it again, just because I could. Wow. Um, you know, and 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 you know, I managed to achieve everything I wanted to achieve um, out of there. But that wasn't easy. And then at sixteen, I left home. As soon as I got finished school, I, I left home. Um, and then I had a, a bit of a break from education because obviously I needed to live and eat. And, you know, coupling the realisation that I was actually probably a survivor of, of child abuse as well as things have come out over the years. But, yeah, it answers a lot of questions why. And then eventually I got a place at John Leggett College in Scunthorpe. Okay. And then... What did you do there? Um, I did a mixture of things there. Um. I did computing technology, although that, that was in its fledgling side of things. Um, I'm a, a musician as well, on top of other stuff. Um, so I play piano, guitar, bass, singer-songwriter, that kind of stuff. Um, so I did, um, I did music technology there as well. So, mm -hmm. so that blended the two technology sides and, and the music passion that I had. Um, and I also did business studies and a couple of other, you know, courses which I thought might be practical and useful but it really wasn't until uh, I left kind of that side and went to Leeds and actually got a job at British Telecom where I was really able to kind of find myself and flourish with the technology side of things. Um, it said that you left home and then it was a couple of years maybe till you went back to college. How old were you when you went to college? So I'm talking college that you perhaps traditionally go to at 16. So I would have been 1920. 1920. Yeah, when I went back to college. And then after that, you got a job at BT? Oh, well, after that, I bummed around for a significant amount of time. I didn't really have a fixed job, if you like. I, I moved in and out of jobs of interest. The only thing that was consistent was was kind of like the music. You know, and, and I was in bands and messing around in recording studios and, you know, doing my best 
because that's ultimately what I wanted to do, I suppose, was, music. you know, yeah, it was music. And, and that was really interesting. Um, and especially when like computer music came out and, and started recording on, you know, the Atari 520 STs going back and, you know, trying to get my guitar to plug into there and mic up a drum kit into a computer and using the very first sequences, MIDI and stuff like that. You know, it kind of blended two things together, which was really great. So I kind of just bummed around like East Yorkshire and Lincolnshire at the time, you know, just almost being a gigging musician in a way, just doing stuff with bands and, you know, kind of like on the pub circuit, almost the, if you like the country and Western scene type stuff. Yeah. But I enjoyed it and I made a living for it, you know. And I think I'd had enough of education at that point because it had been so difficult that it was like I got what I needed to get out of it. Now, you know, it was time to focus on stuff for me. How did you manage your dyslexia when you went to girl college? No, Scunthorpe, sorry. Yeah, just... Scunthorpe. Yeah, John Leggett College in Scunthorpe. Um, again, it, it was a difficult time because I was embarrassed by it, so didn't want to admit that. Okay. Although it did follow me because it, it was finally recognised, or maybe diagnosed is the right word, you know, so people were aware of it. But again, it was something I kept very quiet. And I mean, even now I fall back on those strategies I learned back in college. Um, I have to do naturally a lot of reading, you know, as everybody knows when you come and do your degree, it's, it's you know, it's, it's not just the practical fun side of things. You have to read a, a lot about that. So I do still find myself falling back on strategies, which I learned back then to read. And it often takes me longer to read a document. And I often find myself printing out and printing out different colored paper if I'm struggling or using different colored highlighter pens to highlight different points and then pulling it back together and often find myself, you know, rewriting documents and rewriting chapters and papers in a way that then I can understand them, yeah. um, which is useful because I can type really quickly so I can get my thoughts out that way. If I tried to handwrite it, my, you'd never read my writing. It's just appalling. So yeah. I should have been, should have been a GP, I think. Yeah. Oh, but, that's not the first thought you need to be a doctor <laughs> but i think that that it, it stems back to the two davids giving me that bbc microcomputer because i that allowed me and ever since then i've always had a computer you know, always had a computer and always managed to find a computer even it's been a, a crappy second hand thing that i've just been able to throw on a very cheap word processor i've always been and always had to use a computer in my learning so you know and and yeah, that got me through. And then again, that, that computers and having to learn those computers, I kind of developed a, a talent and a passion for that. And so that was really useful. And when I did come to actually try and settle down a little bit, and that's when I moved to Leeds. And I loved moving to Leeds because growing up in small villages, as I said, more dogs than people, the city was just huge. And I was anonymous and it was amazing. And I could do what I wanted. Yeah. And I mean, bear in mind, I was still a relatively, you know, young man at this point. You know, I was only early 20s and ended up working at British Telecom and, and ended up really luckily getting involved with a couple of projects that we all know now and are ubiquitous across our lives. Um, so I started working in the prepay phone team. Um, and I was lucky enough to be outside. Um, we had like a, 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 a shelter where everybody used to go out for a cup of coffee and a cigarette and stuff like that. And I remember sat there um, having a break with a couple of the engineers, the technical engineers at British Telecom, and they were in there. They were just chatting stuff and they were writing down on the wall because there was a whiteboard in there, their ideas about how they could make the internet work over a mobile phone. Wow. And I was just chatting with them, just asking them questions and, and getting really geeky. And they asked me if I wanted to work with them in the team. And I was like, oh, that's not going to happen. Don't be daft. Yeah. And then the next thing I know, I got an email and was seconded into that team as part of the project. Wow. And, and, and that was it, you know, and that, I don't know, it kind of lit something. I, I you know, was, was really heavily involved in that, working across a lot of companies um, in including uh, Compaq and various other computing companies, um, Nikon, and uh, not Nikon, sorry, um, Nokia in, in Switzerland, 
a company called Bright in Cambridge to bring all of this technology together to allow you to scratch off a card, enter in a number and get a tenner on your phone, you know, but then on top of that, use that phone to access the internet. And this is way, way, way before iPhones. Yeah. This is way, way before iPhones. And I was, it was amazing to start to see how all of that lot came together. And I learned an absolute ton about mobile communications and networks and this, that, and the other. And, and then things were going brilliantly with my career. And um, this would now be about 2000, I'd say. So things going well, really established at BT, absolutely loving it. And then I had a massive accident. And um, I got crushed. Some industrial shelves fell on me, top down, completely and utterly crushed. Crushed my spine in four vertebrae. Couldn't walk. Hospitalized for months. Traction. Took me about a year and a half to learn to walk again. This was 2000? Yeah. Just as Aaron, my eldest lad, was born. Oh, my gosh. So that was, that was super traumatic. And... It was like, well, what am I going to do now? What am I going to do now? Still working at BT? Still working at BT. I was on sick. And it, it, it kind of that year's hiatus made me realise that, well, hang on a minute, I can do more. I can do more. Um, so on a whim, I applied to Bolton. Why Bolton? Well, at the time, um, I was, well, I still do suffer from imposter syndrome, but that's a, that's a completely different story. Um, you know, I still expect somebody to knock Welcome on door. Welcome to the team. <laughs> yeah. I still expect somebody to knock on door and go, "Oi, farmer boy, out!" Yeah, um, but um, why Bolton? Um, I, I looked at Salford, um, and I didn't like it. It was too. It felt wrong. It didn't feel close. And then I came for an interview here at Bolton, and obviously, as a mature student, I was made to feel immediately welcome. Immediately welcome. Um, and, and, and it was also the, the lecturers at the interview that, yeah, I was a mature student and I gave them a background that we've talked about a little bit like that. And they, they just, it just wasn't a barrier. It, they, it was just, no, no, don't worry. That's fine. Not a problem. We can help you. We can, we, we can support you in any way you need, you know, come on in and give us a try. If you don't like it, you can always leave. And I'm sorry to say that after the first semester I did. Wow. Really? Yeah. Um, and it, it, what was you? What did you start in? What was the degree? I started in. Um, we did the start the degree in software engineering, uh -huh. so I'd gone back onto the computing um, because that's what I wanted to do. But then it, it was just all the reading and everything else, and all of those experiences I had as a kid just flooded back. And you know, I mean, talk about triggering my triggers. It, it really, you know, it, it brought back all sorts of haunting memories, and mm -hmm. it, it was more. It's childhood trauma, isn't it? Well, childhood trauma. It was, but it was the fear of failure that had been instilled in me for all those years. And the, you're the thick lad in the back of the class that can't even write his damn name. What are you doing? You're doing a degree. Wow. Why? You know, it was, yeah, I just gave in. I, I gave in. Even, even though I got some pretty good results from my first couple of submissions, again, that imposter syndrome, like it's, and, you know, it doesn't matter how good you are. If somebody's, you know, or if you've had a self-perception, you know, throughout your formative years that you weren't good enough, then, you know. It doesn't even, matter what anyone says. Yeah, it doesn't matter what anyone says. But And then to step into an institution like Bolton, where although they were super welcoming, it, it's still a degree. And, you know, th there's, there's still the expectations. And just saying to yourself, well, I'm a degree student, you know. And my lads are old enough now to and they've been doing theirs and you know one of my laddies doing um, astronomy and planetary sciences and he's bouncing around the house going i'm doing my degree it's brilliant and so it, it does carry that you know doing a degree yeah you know and and i gave in i gave in i just i, I couldn't do it um and i mean at the time i still wasn't working because i was still on sick and it was an opportunity while i was still recovering to to try this and i thought i'll just go back to british telecom and I spent some time ruminating and actually kicking myself over the decision a lot, thinking maybe I didn't give it enough. Um, and then the opportunity of voluntary redundancy came up um, at, at BT, the restructuring, moving call centers around, all of that stuff. And I thought, 
and I looked at the numbers and, and the money I'd get from the, the, the voluntary redundancy would be enough um, to support the family, bearing in mind I had a, a young son at that point as well. So he must have only been, I don't know, it'd have been two, one, maybe two at that point. Um, and I thought, right, no, I'm, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to go back because I was talking to people at work and the, th <laughs> the one thing that inspired me more than anything else is I had a colleague at work um, and I, I won't say his name out of, out of professional courtesy and respect, but he was like, what do you want a degree for? He's like, what's the point? What do you want a degree for? It doesn't make any difference. Why would you want to get a degree? And it was just like that, that I don't know. Yeah, it was like that was a red rag to a bull at that point. But this is a guy who was talking to me and he said, well, I've got a master's in the degree and look what it's done for me. And I'm like, no, no, that's what it's done for you because you haven't done anything with it, you muppet. And he was, he was a call center worker. You know, and I'm, I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not disrespecting. I've been there, I've done it. it you know, it's hard work, that job sometimes. But he, that was all he elected to do. And I thought, no, I'm not like And that was a red rag to a bull. How dare you tell me I can't. And maybe that's what I needed was somebody to turn around, you know, and not, oh, there's the thick lad in the back of the class, put him in a box and label him. Nobody ever told me I couldn't. They just assumed. assumed. And, yeah. So and someone's it, telling you that you can't do it. You're like, hang on, hang a, minute. on a minute. Yeah. And, and, that, and as an adult, it, that, I mean, there's a long train of thought that got to that point. Yeah. Um, so I contacted my old tutors and went, can I come back? Um, and this time, in, instead of going into software engineering, I chose computer, what is it? It's not computer networks and security. That's what I teach on now. It, internet communications and networking. So that was my first degree, which falls back on what I did at, at British Telecom. Yeah. Hi. And then I sat down and had some really good conversations with the tutors here. Um, a guy called Martin Stanhope, who no longer works at the university, retired a couple of years ago. Um, he was just amazing he got where I was coming from straight away and just put stuff in place talked to me about what I needed to do for reading assignments put me in contact with people about you know what support I would need um just they just opened doors and that was it I flew um and it it was it was enlightening. It was liberating. It was pure freedom to, to sit there and communicate my ideas across and to have the learning experience that I'd always thought that learning was about. Do you know what I mean? That the, the doors that opened in my head, the, the, the ideas and thinking and having those ideas, being able to communicate those ideas down on, on paper, you know, and have people acknowledge them as being genuinely real. Um, I don't know. It was just, I had kind of had that with the two Davids that was emancipatory in the fact that they recognized that oh, I wasn't just a thick lad at the back of the class, you know, I, and then to have that at a degree level with, and it's not just Martin, they, they, it's other colleagues. There's a, a, a guy who works here now, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say I'm a colleague of his now is Adam Isherwood. Um, and, you know, he taught me in the second year of my degree, just as my daughter was being born. And we've both got daughters of the same age. And, you know, it, it's these people, the real people who have worked out there in the industry, who've, who've just got so much time to help you out. Um, you know, and I got a first. Yeah, and I was over the moon, absolutely. I, I, I do remember handing in my final dissertation and then going home and I think crying solidly for an hour. Oh. You know, that I'd done it. I didn't care what mark I was going to get at that point. It's the fact that I'd gone on that journey and I got to the other side of it and I'd done it. Yeah. And I can still feel that feeling now. And in I my darkest days. You're talking about it. I'm well, in my, in my darkest days, it's that feeling that, you know, when I get that imposter syndrome, when people are telling me I can't, and when I'm telling myself I can't, that feeling, yeah, that 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 one moment of submitting that assignment, posting it through the box, and emailing a copy off, 
yeah, that was, yeah, that, that still keeps me going. And it keeps me going now. And I mean, you know, my, my educational journey hasn't stopped. It, it's gone forward and gone backwards. Um, I did my um, uh, PGCE in teaching and learning in higher education. Um, and I went on to do a taught PhD. And I did the first three modules of that taught PhD. And it was brilliant. But then I realized myself that it's like, no, I don't quite know enough to do this on my own yet. Okay. Um, so I stepped back and did my master's. So my master's in teaching and learning in higher education. Uh, um, so, uh, you know, it's going forwards, but recognizing where you are within yourself. And it wasn't that I'm not capable of doing the PhD. I absolutely know that I am. The results from the modules of the top PhD were absolutely clear that I could do it. And the feedback I was getting you know, of professors here at the university. Um, do you think an element of everything you've just told me is playing up in the, the fact that you think you can't do it or you, that you, you stop doing it? Probably. It got to that point where I was, you know, and I mean, you're a PhD candidate yourself, so you know that you get, you're almost let loose in a way. And, you know, you've got guidance from your supervisor and the support you get from your supervisor is phenomenal, but you have to do that. You know, you have to do the reading and you have to do the research. And yeah, so maybe it got to the crunch point where I'd stepped out of the tour element, if you like, in the classroom with lots of peers to then sitting down in front of a computer on my own and having to do my research. It was rabbit's headlight. And I thought, no, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll go back and I'll do another master's. That's the easiest maybe way. At this point, so maybe at this point, I need to tell you that you can't do a PhD and then you're going to go off and do it. <laughs> Well, I'll get my um, I'll get my master's dissertation submitted, and then I will be doing my PhD. Because again, it's funny because, and this is my professional life then in a way. And how did I end up at Bolton as a professional, as a student here? Well, in my third year of my undergraduate degree, um, one of the heads of school um, was looking for a student intern to just do some basic help around the place, setting up, and you know, they created a little role called the associate systems administrator. Um, and I applied for it and was just dead cheeky and just went, um, again, it was a guy called Jeff Ormerod who had been here for a long time. Um, I just was cheeky and went up to him and went, can I have the job? Give us a job. Come on, I can do that. You know, it was almost comical in a way. And he went, right, okay, fine. We'll, we'll let you do it. So they introduced me um, to the systems admin and they stuck me on 20 hours a week and I never left. Um, that's not quite true um, because when my, degree finished my contract with the university finished um but i loved it so much um and it was the head of school a guy again who's retired now called andrew hartley um and every monday morning i would email him without fail at nine o'clock going can i have my job back and then the emails progressed to me ringing him at monday morning every nine o'clock going can i have my job back you know and i mean fair enough he got he, you know he, he realized <laughs> sorry Please get involved for stalking. <laughs> it was probably borderline, I have to say. Resilience, that's what it is. Uh, but then I'm, I'm really pleased to say that one day he did say, yeah, come on, man. Wow. Have your job back. Um, so I did. And then, you know, to, to move into a lecturer position, because um, I was still doing the sound engineering stuff, you know, the music hadn't actually stopped then and the bands I were in were, were actually getting somewhere at the time. So I supported Kasabian and, you know, did a festival or two and you know it was it was pretty awesome wow um so a lecture is a job no not not today <laughs> um uh so a lecturer's job came up in sound engineering so i just applied for it i did not again it's that you know i'm just going to do it what have i got to lose type moment didn't think i would and did and 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 it was weird because it was that that triggered me to do the um teaching and learning qualification um and then that's where i found my passion for teaching and that really then that that was again was another elevating moment if you like it's like wow this is something i did not think i would be passionate about but this is amazing because i'm working i'm dealing with people and i'm helping people and then it was reflecting on my journey to get to that point that i could help people and that that i was like paying it forward in a way you know, the, the, I can see me in 
my students, and I, I, I like to teach first years, um, and I still do teach first years now. I teach first years on the um, computer networks and security, um, and I teach them programming. Ironically, one of the things that I walked away from, wow. you know, um, when I first started my degree, and I teach that really difficult module that they struggle with, and I've got all of my wealth of experience as being a student that went on the journey that I have and to see students and obviously you get students in the class that are just they get it and it's great and I love helping those guys and I learn just as much from them as 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 I teach if you like but I also learn just as much and more from the students that need that support because I learn about them and the journey that they're going through and how that and how my experiences and I'm not overt about this in the classroom with them but I'm overt in the way that I can reflect and use what I've gone through and help them and guide them. And that was where I was going with this. I was thinking, how have your experiences shaped you as a tutor or a lecturer? Well, that that's that was the shaping. It, it was because when I first got the sound engineering job, I was teaching um, the computer side of sound engineering, the computer technologies involved in that. And um, I was a little bit, clueless and a little bit scared really because again it's that you know and, and as, as much experience as I've had in studios and things like that there's a difference there in having to impart that knowledge you know to, to a, a bunch of students who you know in my head they were there and I felt there was a certain level of expectation on me um, and it really it took it took a couple of semesters to almost feel my way around what I was doing uh, but then it was like, oh, no, I, I, I need the master's on this. And then when it was the, the theories that got put in there, and it's like, no, I, so I am actually doing these. I am actually doing this stuff. This is, I'm doing it. I just didn't know it had a name for it. You know, I didn't know it was called, you know, um, community of inquiry when I'm getting everybody to sit together and share their ideas and work out problems. And, you know, all of these different different underpinnings. Yeah. And, and that, that, again, that, that, that lit that second fire. Um. And then through a really bizarre circuitous route of things that happened, um, I ended up back teaching computing and networking. Because the sound engineering was part of the creative technology subject area. And um, a colleague was, I think he was retiring or he was going off for some reason. And um, they asked me to step in and teach one of his modules. And it was like, yeah, brilliant. I'm almost like coming back home. So I ended up lecturing and being a lecturer inside the faculty and the school where I was a student and, wow. and it felt weird because now people who taught me were now my colleagues were now my colleagues and you know over the years became friends and it, it was such a weird feeling and such a weird journey but it felt like I was coming home and, and that was so strange but yeah again that that freed me then to start exploring my passion of teaching and learning more. Did I hear you say you have a couple of masters? Uh, well, I've got my postgraduate in um, my postgraduate master's level certificate in teaching and learning, and then now I'm doing my full masters. So I, you know, started. This is actually didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, went back again and went back and you know, so I started the PhD and then dropped back and yeah, started a masters again. So, yeah, and it's. Well, and then that that passion, and then th this opportunity came up to apply for um, an associate professor of of teaching and learning. Again, I could have applied for the professorship, but again, I didn't feel like I could, so I, I restrained myself back on that. And I think I was right in that one because I didn't have the I didn't have the national and the international experience that I think you know what what we were looking for the connections. I had lots of national connections working in sound engineering and teaching sound engineering. You, you build those up over the years. And then likewise with the teaching side of things, I got heavily involved with, again, back on my knowledge of British Telecom, got involved with lots of communications companies that I knew. Um, but I just didn't have that national impact, uh, uh, international impact. So I applied for the associate teaching professor. And, and it was pretty scary because you have your teaching observed by um, a national teaching professor and you know you've got to write so here was the me now writing this communique about my philosophies on teaching and 
why do I feel like I can do this? And then my, again, my, you know, you go through a couple of rounds of observations of your teaching. It's really nerve wracking. Yeah. Uh, it really is nerve wracking. Um, you know, and you've got a national teaching fellow who is recognized nationally, you know, as somebody who is the epitome of excellence in teaching and learning sitting there in a classroom and I'm teaching and I know he's judging me. Uh, and th there was a funny moment where we had some international visitors to the university and they walked into the classroom in the middle of me being observed. Mm -hmm. And um, um, these were Chinese nationals and, you know, th there was a, a language barrier there. And I honestly thought I was being tested. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly thought I was being tested as part of my professorship that, you know, how do I handle interruptions in the class and, you know, this, that, and the other. And, and, and uh, it wasn't a test. They, they just generally walked into the wrong room. Um, you know, I, I was panicking, absolute bad mouth dry, shaking, the, you know, the whole works. It was, because it wasn't just a normal teaching session. It was a job interview as well, if you like. So it was, it was double-edged, um, you know, because normally I'd have had a laugh and a joke with the people that came in. And in the end, I did have a laugh and a joke with them and, you know, chuckled about language barriers. And we got, we got the problem solved and got them into the right classroom. Um, but yeah, so that stands out. But yeah, then, then somebody said, yeah, I got the job. Oh. Um, and then it's funny now because I've drifted out of computing, although I do still teach and I still insist on teaching because, you know, I'm, I'm now um, uh, a lead member within the student experience team within the university. And again, this I think this is all of my journey, all of my learning journey really has led me up to this point now because I'm, I'm looking after aspects of our personal tutoring side of things and um you know our our uh, leap ahead program which looks at identifying students who may need support with academic writing and well-being and you know all of these kinds of things and, I, and i'm looking after that now and you know I get, I get to set a little bit of direction about where we go with that so all of my all of my experience really now plays in. I'm not talking about my teaching experience either to some degree. I'm talking about my life experience as a student, as a pupil at school with dyslexia and fighting those battles internally. And then having, you know, having the gumption really to come and try to go to university. And then I, I like I say, now I can not only look after the first years in my class, but I feel like I can look after all of the first years across the entirety of the university. And, and that means a lot to me. You know, I, okay. Um, you know, I, I know all of my students by name, every single one of them, all the way through their three years of their degree, you know, um, even though I might not see them until they come back and talk to me about their projects and this, that, and the other after the first year, I, I know them all. And, I start to feel like I know all of the first years in the university and everybody's different and everybody has their own challenges and circumstances. But speaking to a lot of students across a lot of different programs and finding out about their journeys and reflecting on mine allows me to work together with colleagues to put in a much more personal touch. Yeah. You know, which, yeah. I'm, I'm, so I've never left Bolton really. I think it's really important. I think I don't think you can buy experience. I think your pathway, everything that you've had to overcome, you can absolutely bring that to your role now and ensure that other students are better supported. Yeah, um, it's funny because I don't. I it's like the goldfish doesn't see the water it swims in. In a way, is that I've always been passionate about learning. Um, I've always wanted to learn, didn't have the opportunities perhaps uh, as a kid. And now looking at the, you know, the scientific data and the research that goes into that, yeah, I would have been in what they would have termed a low participation area and, you know, uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged, you know, had, um, you know, learning disadvantages as well on top of all of that lot. So I would have, I would have, you know, I would have been absolutely ticking a lot of boxes that, you know, uh, you know that the the, the the people do tick, unfortunately, to some degree. And I often wonder that if I'd have gone and done my degree now, would I have left the first time? Yeah. Because although the support there was amazing, 
there wasn't the research there there is now into things like personal tutoring and student support services we really do know what works to help students you know and that that's not there now uh, that wasn't there then i should say but it is is now so we can use that and then that's where my learning continues because that's what my research is going to be and it's about supporting students and particularly and again this maybe comes back from where i was you know 40 years ago perhaps now is about communication and how we as people communicate with other people who are just starting out their journey and how we can not only communicate knowledge you know but communicate support and communicate a belief and how do we transform and give people the power and you know, the self-belief that they can transform themselves. And that's what it is. That's what coming to Bolton did for me. And, you know, if if it wasn't Bolton, I think it would have been a and other university, but I'm proud to say it was Bolton, is that that's what it did for me. It transformed me from, although the the self-doubt is still there and the imposter syndrome doesn't go away to some degree, um, it gave me the belief that I could do it. And I'm now sat here and... I've done it and I'm still doing it and I'm not going to give up. What does the future hold for you? What do you think your educational path will go next? Oh, I'll, I'll be, yeah, my PhD, without a doubt. Yeah. And if it takes me a decade to get there, I'll get there. You know, and sometimes it's not about, yeah, okay, you've got a set amount of time to do certain stuff in, you know, and, you know, a PhD part time is six, seven years, something like that. You know, um, I'll get there. You've I'll get there. Through. Thanks. Absolutely. I hope so. Absolutely. Yeah. Somebody told me um, the other day that what's really important when it comes to choosing your area to, for PhD is passion and your investment in your research area. And, you know, I think listening to your talk, I think your passion absolutely radiates through and you definitely need to start this journey. Oh, I will. And I know what it's going to be in. And like I say, it's going to be about communications and, you know, how I as a professional communicate, but it's not just about my profession. It's about communicating my passion. It's a hard thing to communicate. You can't fake it, I don't think. No, you can't. You know, if you're stood up there in front of students and you're, you know, lecturing about your subject, you can't fake that passion. You know, and... So I want to know why. I want to know what that is. And likewise, when supporting, how do you communicate empathy? And, you know, we know we do, but, you know, what works? What doesn't work? And Everybody's different as well, aren't they? And I'm yeah. just thinking back to your childhood when those two Davids made such an impact in your life. How different would it have been if you didn't have Davids in your life? I'd have been on the farm. And... I would probably not have even got a single GCSE in all honesty. Cause, um, and again, this is no disrespect to my brother, but he didn't, he chose, you know, he went down the manual labor route, you know, and, you know, he's, he's still working and he's working hard and, you know, he, he's doing all right for himself. Um, but it, it wasn't something that I wanted to do. I, yeah. You know, I, I can't remember what it was. Is it? it was just, I can't even remember where that started. I think it might have been, you know, kind of like ornithology and somebody gave me a bird book and that, that triggered me into like, kind of like the sciences and realized that, wow, there's this whole catalog of animals here and getting my binoculars out and documenting those up and writing up my notes and trying to draw the pictures. It, I think it probably started from that, you know, being on the farm and having animals, you, you know, and learning more about those. And that, that, that started it. But yeah, the two Davids, David Hill and David Gledall, I don't think my life would be, I wouldn't be sat here now at the University of Bolton as an associate teaching professor, um, talking to you, Lindsay, about the journey I've been on, you know. That's me, PhD. <laughs> yeah, I, w- I wouldn't be here, you know, and there's nobody else in my family that's got a degree. And, you know, I'm pleased to say that my kids are now doing their degrees. You know, and there is some interesting statistic out there that, again, I was talking to a colleague about a couple of years back, 
that there seems some data suggests that student or kids are much more likely to go and do a degree if their parents have a degree than they are to start smoking if their parents smoke. So wow. that's really quite interesting there in terms of that not only are we, you know, as, as a potential student, not only am I changing my life, but I can see now I've changed the life of my kids. Yeah. And I, I look at my, you know, my brother's kids and how it's an option for them to go do it. And, you know, I have encouraged everybody in the family to, you know, to go do a degree. Um, my dad didn't do a degree but he did go back to night school and got his GCSEs in accounting and maths, which he used to set up his own business. You know, and he said there was, that's because I could do it. And, you know, I helped inspire my dad and I felt proud, you know, to pay him back a little for all those jam sandwiches he chucked in a rucksack for me. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. Yeah, I think, um, and there's quite a few important messages that come out from your journey, but one that seems to strike with me right now is the is actually recognizing the importance of stepping back. You know, you talk about you started a degree and then stopped and went back. I think that's just as important. Sometimes it's okay to reflect that you you didn't finish it. You you know you you did step away because the alternative of carrying on in a situation where maybe it's not right for you or you don't feel supported or you don't feel like you can achieve it, it can be really negative, can't it? It can have a massive negative effect that you've pushed through on something. And what if you'd have come away with a really bad score and it scars you for life, whereas you stepped away, you took a breath and then you came back and smashed it? Yeah, and I think, I don't think there's anything wrong in that at all. And, you know, even even now I can see my, some students are struggling with it and they're not just, they're not struggling with the work necessarily intellectually. They're just struggling because of where they are in the life, you know, and sometimes it's just people aren't in a good place. Yeah. You know, and I will say to them, look, pause, take a pause, you know, take a break, come back, you know, and you might come back in two years. You might come back in 10 years. I did have a student that, came back after 15 years to finish his degree you know, and and this and he came back after he'd retired from his job really because he felt he had the headspace to do it justice for himself so this was a guy who'd come back to finish his degree knowing he wasn't going to get a job at the end of it he just needed to finish it because at the time family work career commitments he didn't have the space or the capacity to do it so he took a big break and came back okay. you know and, and he was brilliant. And he was a brilliant, brilliant coder. He wealth of industrial experience, but was really, really anxious as, you know, as an academic student. Wow. You know, so if you've got a guy who's been in industry for 20 years, a professional computer programmer, and was really nervous about writing an academic assignment. So wow. it just goes to show, you know, everybody out there, you know, you walk into a classroom full of students and everybody has a story and everybody's gone through a journey like I have one way, shape or form, you know, and it's, it's understanding that. Here it is. I think that brings us nicely on to um, the current situation. You were talking about that like, every student has issues and I think that's more prevalent in the last year really, isn't it? It's this pandemic has affected everybody in so many different ways. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I've got, I've got five kids at home. So, you know, you can imagine homeschooling five ranging from, well. Degree level to. Yeah, well, from de degree level to primary. You know, um, and, and it's really, really challenging. Yeah. And it's been challenging. Um, I found it difficult. Um, the first lockdown was horrendous, you know, in a way. Um, but it was also good in a way because I had, we had to change things at the university really quickly. Yeah. Uh, um, and again, I was fortunate enough to be, you know, in a position where I've got knowledge of technology, which obviously was now was a big boom. Yeah. Um, but I was also fortunate in a position to be in a position to, to help and influence how we supported students remotely. So I spent a lot of time in the first lockdown researching and putting in place things that we could do to support students. And I think as a result of that, that's, that's made life a lot easier work-wise. 
yeah. don't get me wrong it's not got any easier in terms of you know job five kids you know but i think um yeah i can see light at the end of the tunnel now how do you think, think hope. how do you think that's going to pan out hope hope uh, i don't think i and and thinking about what we do at the university we aren't going to go back to the way it was we can't go back to the way it was so much has changed and there are so many positive things here that have come out of this pandemic in terms of and i, I sure as hell don't mean that the losses that you know people have experienced and you know i've experienced those through through covid and i'm not talking about those i'm talking about the positive aspects the way that we could potentially you know it might have been a catalyst for societal change you know i, I hope and I think those are those are those, those. That's the key feeling I think I've got from this, is hope. That's a really nice, I think, really nice way to end this. Hope. Yeah. Cool. Oh, I have hope. Yeah. I feel like there's a song in that. <laughs> Probably is. I might write it. Yes. <laughs> I could just dance in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, do you know, that's an amazing story that you've told us today. I think um, I, I just keep having the word tenacious just keeps coming back into my head when I think of you now. I think your tenacity throughout has just been immense. And you say that and I just think of tenacious D, but there we go. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Oh, thank you so much for talking. No worries. Uh, I hope to see you soon. You will. See you later.